pass it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Maria. Um, thanks so much for uh, hosting it. Um, like, like I'll just finish this pop-up. Uh, cool. So thanks so much for hosting this. Uh, happy to be here um, to share context. Right? Like I've been in tech for like seven, eight years now. Uh, I've built like really large scale systems in a logistics company. Uh, I've worked at Elasticsearch. Um, in, in my time, like I've seen systems evolve from uh, like a really small startup and then like where we have to scale up to like 500k requests per second. Like, like we have like millions of customers. Uh, so that's why I thought like it'll be valuable to share my experience uh, in this format. Um, yeah, so I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, I hope it's visible. Um, is it visible, Maria? Yeah, all good. Okay, awesome. So quickly about me, uh, I'm a founder of Scalescape. Uh, we are building a DevOps platform. I'll, I'll share it in detail probably at the end. Um, so I'll also stop my video. Um, so the, the context here is, I think like we'll touch on a few things, right? Like one is uh, we'll touch on microservices, we'll touch on a bit on like monoliths, uh, and then like slowly that's what you would have scaled. Uh, and then we'll touch on like how we can leverage Kafka or like event driven systems uh, in order to uh, scale your system like for really uh, large set of customers, right? So that's why I sort of shared the poll. Um, so if you are all done with it, um, like I'll, can, Maria, can you sort of show me the results? So that way, like I'll be able to tweak the content uh, based on the experience of users. If you're all like new to it, I'll add much more context around the basics rather than diving into deeper advanced topics. Uh, so yeah, cool, awesome. Uh, I don't know whether you can see it, uh, but like largely I see a mix of like monoliths, people have worked in microservices. Um, good, good bunch of people like have used uh, event-driven systems. Uh, Kafka, less context. Um, a uh, lot of people still are new. So in that sense, like I'll add a bit of context uh, and then I'll dive in deeper, right? So thanks for the poll answering. So as I said, like we'll touch on the transition, right? Like it's, it's a slow evolution. So I'll, I'll put it this way, right? If there is one thing you need to learn while you're building uh, distributed systems, uh, assume everything is going to fail. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of systems you're building, but be it microservices, monolith, whatever it is, it's going to fail at different points of your system. So in that sense, so let's, let's start with the scenario, right? So I'm not here to like debate whether it's best to start with monolith or microservices. Of course, there are companies which scale well with monoliths. There are a lot of companies which migrated to microservices and it, it helped them. Uh, but I think like one thing personally, what I've seen is unless you have a tooling and ecosystem built for handling monoliths in a best way, like, like let's say Google, we all know they're all monorepo, but they still have good practices and tooling and ecosystem to um, scale for their customers with the monolith architecture, right? Um, so not necessarily like monolith architecture, like they would have monorepo, but they still have like a different kind of means to deploy and, and do things. So the assumption is, let's say, hey, if you have a monolith, if you have a failure, uh, the whole system is going to fail. Um, it depends on the deployment, of course, but as you adopt microservices, there is a lot of benefits we can sort of um, benefit from. Um, and but even in microservices, of course, there's there can be bottlenecks, right? So let's say this is just a quick scenario. Like you might have multiple instances of the same service. Like this is just zoomed in version of like you might have 500 microservices or like 50 microservices. But on that one particular service, you will have multiple instances. And then like even there, you can have bottlenecks in that system, right? So then obviously, like as you uh, scale, uh, you will notice like you will move on to uh, like setting up replication or adding in uh, sharding and increasing instances, increasing load balances and everything like that. Uh, so let me just see uh, whether you can see the system. So just quickly sharing. Um, I'll stop the whole screen share uh, and then I'll share my whole system. So as you can see here, right, you don't just stop with scaling uh, multiple uh, databases, but you can go ahead and then like introduce 
uh, country level sharding or other strategies, right? Uh, and then you can even go on and expand into like multiple regions within uh, that country. So let's say in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm just depicting, hey, US, you have more uh, scale, but Canada, you have less scale. So you have a single region here, but you have the same setup, but sort of scaled up uh, to handle uh, the load accordingly, right? So that, that's just the context. So having said all of this, in order to evaluate and also like figure out whether something is working for you, usually you need to have a checklist of things where this is what you compare with respect to like be it microservices, be it um, monoliths, um, and then even event-driven systems to say whether this system is working well for you or not. So let's say like most of the benefits we get from microservices, even in my personal experiences, so you can scale different systems independently. So let's say in this case, assume it's a different service, uh, you can just scale up the service one uh, for multiple instances rather than you scaling the hardware or like rather than you have to, having to do vertical, vertical scaling for the whole monolith, right? So if you have a database, then again, the same thing, right? Like unless you have multiple services and then the data is, uh, split across different databases, like you, you're going to end up with a single database. So that, that's what I mean by scaling independently, right? The same thing, like when you do a deployment, unless you have an ecosystem, when you deploy Monolith, uh, most of the times it's like, hey, you see a small downtime, right? Uh, of course, like there are exceptions, right? Like you can do red green deployment, blue green deployments, and all of that. But if you have microservices, if your changes are uh, limited to, let's say, service one, you only deploy service one, and most of the other systems are not affected by it, right? Um, let's say blast radius. Like, of course, this is something like um, specific to microservices as well, but the context is if something fails, with respect to your whole system, how much the failure is cascaded, right? Like, hey, do you see a whole system downtime or like, is it like a partial downtime? For example, if you're using a ride hailing app, if the promotion is not working, it's fine. Like, but if your whole system is down and then if you can't board uh, cabs or if you can't pay, it's it's super critical issue, right? So even if you are using microservices, of course, you need to have good practices in place uh, to control the blast radius. Uh, of course, like choice of stack, uh, like the time taken to do whatever the setup task, like from dev time to let's say deployment time, uh, ownership, domain, and all of that, uh, you should have this variables or factors listed down. And then you should discuss on this particular points in order to figure out like whether monolith or microservices or like how you are evolving over time. Uh, so having said that, like I, I think like most of the cases you would think your microservices is good enough uh, for your organization, right? Uh, but let's take the scenario, right? Like I'm, I'm just taking the domain of, uh, let's say Uber or like any ride hailing or food delivery services. Uh, you will ride, um, like you will book a cab, you will get a driver, you will have to do payments, you might have some promotion and stuff like that. So in that context, this is just a like a small random representation of that particular domain. Uh, let's say in order to complete my order, you might be calling five, six different services, or like even you will end up building a backend for front end. Uh, the dependency or like the mesh sort of structure evolves over time, right? So in that sense, even though whatever like advantages we I was mentioning uh, like a bit back, it becomes a bottleneck over time. Uh, of course, like how do you figure out bottleneck? Uh, like all of that, like probably we'll discuss at the end of the event. But I'm just giving you a picture of like even if you scale with microservices after deploying and scaling independently, uh, and then you building a structure around it, the closely knitted microservices architecture can bring up an issue. For, let's say, for instance, like your order service is critical, but assuming the same instance where promotion service is down, you shouldn't fail the whole request, right? Um, you should ideally have a system in place where, hey, my promotion is not applied, but we can recredit it. But in this case, it's not possible. And then let's also take an instance where the system is just uh, slow, right? Uh, a single service, like a latency uh, increase, like the performance degradation, 
can affect your whole system because pretty much every microservice will look like it's talking to each other unless you have to find the right boundary, right? Uh, so the point here is when you have a number of microservices growing beyond the point, uh, that's when like we see people talking about it's too much microservices. Hey, the microservices is not working well for us. We are like some companies actually have reverted back to monolith. It just said like they adopted better practice because now they know what is needed. Uh, but yeah, like you see all this transition, right? Like monoliths to microservices, microservices back to monoliths and all of that. But now think about how do we evolve this system without doing that drastic migration, but still like fixing the problem, but still scaling beyond the same factors we talked about, right? So now that's where Kafka or event-driven systems comes into play. So let's 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 talk about quickly about the details a bit, uh, like before going into the architecture. So Kafka is like just like any other PubSub system. If you have used Google PubSub, RabbitMQ, or uh, like any other like queuing mechanisms, it's similar to that. But it's it's slightly like more evolved in a way that like internally, it helps in a lot of aspects in like producing side, consuming side, and also scale, right? Like it's built in LinkedIn. Uh, it's it's massively used in so many high scale companies now. So now like we'll quickly touch on the key uh, terms, right? So in this case, like I have a bunch of services. I have a customer service. I have a driver service, and then I have let's say I have a payment service. Rather than the microservices talking to each other, like you send messages to a queue. Uh, in this case, like it's called topics. And then the downstream uh, like services, they consume from that topic and then they operate on it. So the producer in this case is a customer service as well as driver service. The consumer in this case is a payment service. And what they produce or the queue of like in this case, it's topic is basically like the topic. And then in this case, like we have offsets and partitions, like we'll talk about it like a bit later. And consumer group is basically a group of consumers. Like let's say, hey, if you have three services, and all of them are getting payment requests as a job, like like a, a job in the queue. And then you don't, you shouldn't be processing, reprocessing the payment again, right? Like ideally, even though you have three services, you should be distributing the messages uh, like evenly across, or like you shouldn't send message one to service one as well as service two, right? Uh, like when I say service, it's like instances in this case. So that is the consumer group. Uh, so, I mean, this is probably a bit detailed, but I'll, I'll probably show it in a while. Uh, the same thing, right? Like that, this is what I was saying. Like in in internally Kafka, there is a concept called like topics and partition. Each topic is is again split into multiple partition. It just helps with scaling. Uh, if you have hundred partitions, you can have hundred consumers running for it. So let's say I'll give you an example. If you have ten thousand messages per second. If you have one partition, there can be only con one consumer, which is consuming at 10,000 messages per second. But if you have 10 partitions, it's almost as if like you can send each partition like 1K request per second. And then all of your consumers in the consumer group just needs to handle like 1K request. It doesn't have to handle like 10K, right? But as a whole, you are handling 10K requests per second uh, with this architecture. So now you can extrapolate, right? Like if you have 100K messages per Second in the queue, you can handle it with like 20 partitions or 50 partitions and stuff like that. Of course, like there is a lot of discussion and nitty gritty details around uh, how many partitions you have in a topic, how many consumers works best for your uh, use case and all of that. But like high level, this is the uh, like detail, right? Uh, I'm, I'm just going to quickly show you what it looks like. Uh, I hope uh, your my screen is visible, like my terminal is. Um, so let me know if, you, if it's not visible. So here I have a local Kafka cluster running. Uh, and then we just talk about three terms, right? Here I'm actually running a consumer. Uh, so I'll just uh, show you. Console, consumer. I ignore the details, but like the point is I am running a consumer uh, to my Kafka. And then as you can see, it's consuming messages, right? So here I have a 
uh, small tool uh, which just sends messages and then like it produces data to the, to the topic. So I'm just gonna send it again. So I'm just gonna probably change the total number of messages um, to let's say like ignore the details. Like I'll come to this later on. Uh, so yeah. So now, as you can see, like the messages are produced here and then it's consuming uh, in this place, right? So here it's one consumer, but we can go to end producer and consumer. Um, like for each topic, there can be multiple producer. A single consumer can consume from like multiple topics and all of that. So here it's the same thing, right? Uh, let's say, as you can see here, um, I have two consumers. Like this is one consumer, this is another consumer. Uh, like I have a watch. Uh, which keeps on sending uh, data to the terminal. Um, yeah, like, so let me just receive it. So as you can see, I have a watch uh, and then it's just sending uh, data to the topic. And then this just receives the timestamp data. Like that, that's what it's visible. So it takes time, but uh, that's the idea, right? Like, like you have a data which is sending and then it just receives it over time. Uh, as you can see here, it just received the message, right? That's just an example. So now we'll go back to the earlier instance, right? So here, as you can see, like it started consuming every second I'm pushing data. There are multiple consumers, so that's why it's slow and stuff like that. But that's the idea. Like you can uh, have a lot of consumers, you can have a lot of uh, data and stuff like that. So I'll also show you the, like probably the details a bit, uh, but it might. So this is what a it, it's just slightly in a different uh, view of whatever we discussed. So this is the topics we have uh, when we push data. Like this is what is being sent. As you can see here, like the data is being pushed, and then like I was running some consumers, right? So let's say I just go and run uh, consumer consumer new one uh, and then it's going to register uh, here in some time. So uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to check this. So you can see, right, like I just registered a consumer and it's available. Like I just have a uh, tool to show uh, the data. So now you have topics. Now you have consumers. A uh, broker is actually Kafka uh, cluster details, uh, but we don't see the producer here, but let's just go to the messages, right? Like, like that's what we were talking about. So here I have messages in this place. And then here you can see, right? I have multiple partitions. This is what I meant by multiple queues over time. So now we have established the um, uh, terminologies, right? I'll just quickly see the, uh, questions. If there is anything which is blocking, I'll answer it. If not, I'll probably take it at the end. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So the consumer group we are running same consumer, not different consumer. Like I'll just clarify, right? So, if you want ten messages, like if let's say you have a top, like in in this, let's just go here. Uh, I have a, a topic here. There is so much data, but let's say. If there is 10 messages, if you want to receive the 10 messages uh, in two services, you will have two different consumer groups. Uh, one called, let's say, payment service. The other one, it could be called, like, let's say, revenue aggregation service. And both of them will be receiving 10 messages. But in order to scale, like, within that consumer group, you can either run two consumer instances or you can run, like, five consumer instances within that consumer group. Uh, it is purely for scaling purposes, but as a whole, uh, this whole set of uh, instances, it could be like um, applications or like a binaries, but it's consume it, it could be consuming from like the same topic. Like, of course, we'll leave the, the rejects, multiple topics and all of that, but that way you are saying, hey, I don't want these two instances to process the same messages. That's the only difference, nothing else. So now let's go back here, right? Like, like the, the architecture we talked about is you have a microservices architecture. It's too tightly knit. I can't scale. Like now, even though we talked about, let's say, hey, initially we talked about our services are independently like deployable. I don't affect other services. But now if you touch on this promotion service, you are affecting the whole system. So now do we, how do we fix that, right? So let's just quickly go here. 
like I'll, I'll come to the production readiness, what, what, how do we figure out bottlenecks, how do we avoid certain things at later end. But in this case, basically, like even though you have built like a microservices or like you have adopted different systems, you have some hacks in place or like you don't have the best uh, like practices in place because of which you are casing a bottleneck. Like, I mean, purely you can't handle more messages or like your processing time is too slow, those factors, right? Uh, but like, this is where you can take a stance and say that, you know what, I will have to reevaluate the architecture and then like use systems like, let's say Kafka or PubSub uh, in order to adopt uh, a better scale, right? So the same thing, uh, like slightly dumped down version of like this, like it becomes tightly knit. But now rather than you going to, like every service calling each other, like in earlier case, uh, payment service ended up calling promotion, uh, you call driver service and everything. But in reality, like, I don't know whether you've noticed in some systems, you can do the payment after the order is processed, completed, or you can give the credit back via promotion, like after five minutes or even after a day, right? Those things doesn't have to be tied together in the actual CRUD flow, right? Like critical transactions flow. So now this architecture is like clear, right? Hey, I have an order as a main entity, like in this case, uh, event, whenever something changes with respect to an order, I push that into my pub subsystem. Uh, here we talk about Kafka, but like, again, it could be anything. Now the state of change is being uh, like listened from different consumers and then they act on it. So for instance, if I create an order, the moment I create an order, like the driver service sees it, it allots the driver. And then it says, hey, go pick up that customer. But let's say the payment service on the other hand, like is looking at the same orders. Once the order is completed, then it just pays drivers. If it's canceled, it doesn't pay. Now, the benefit of this architecture is you're not only scaling in with respect to performance and, uh, the need of like customers high scale, but it also lets you scale in terms of domain and your business, right? Like it could be promotion service or it could be, hey, the moment a customer does like hundred orders, give them a fancy promotion. Like you don't have to keep calling that and like calling that like logic in every order creation flow, right? Like that's what you would have ended up like otherwise if, if you haven't had this architecture, but now, this separate service can listen to all the orders and give a promotion if you reach the hundredth order. Or it could be like we can create a new service to say, hey, every day, how many orders you made for a driver, or in a month, this is how much you have uh, made like over time. This is how much you made as a tip. Like all of this aggregation can be done in a separate service and it doesn't have to be tightly knit with. Uh, the services. So as you could notice, I also represent a database here, right? In the earlier case, you would be calling other data, like, like other service in order to fetch any kind of detail there. But now with this architecture, we don't necessarily have to depend on uh, the actual source of truth or service. Like you can clone some set of details, right? So that way, like you're just making it faster. So when you're aggregating drivers, uh, revenue per week, you can keep a like a driver ID key in your orders or like in your database. So that way, not only you are like simplifying the process, but you're also like not depending on like other services. So it's again, there is a like a good balance of like cloning data. Like you shouldn't be cloning the complete data. But what I'm trying to say is with the right architecture, you shouldn't create so much interdependency between other services, let's say a payment service shouldn't be calling drivers again. Ideally, you should be sending events back to PubSub and then listening to that. So the whole data and like what you listen to is events. That's what you will be listening. So whenever you, let's say, have a need to call a different service, just evaluate whether, hey, is this something only I need? Is this something like, is it okay to receive via events? Will there be other teams and other future services who's going to need this data? Then like put it in a queuing system, like a pub sub thing, right? So the, the only biggest factor is it's going to be eventually consistent system. There is a lot of things like your systems have to be item potent. Uh, you can't 
uh, assume ordering and stuff like that. Um, because like whenever there is a distributed architecture, uh, you can as well like, like retry when there is failures. So in that sense, your consumers have to be item put in a way that like, like it's possible that like you're receiving the same message for payment processing twice, but you have to handle it appropriately. So now quickly go into uh, like some details on like what you need to have in place to uh, like deal with issues, right? Uh, it is applicable for microservices or distributed systems, but the ideal case is uh, you need to have like a production readiness checklist and then the, like go through all of that in order to have the like a good good well established system like a reliable system for instance if you have too many sub microservices you should have a sensible timeout for like each and every api uh, you should always say hey if there is any request which is taking more than like let's say 50 ms or 100 ms i'm going to consider it as a failure you shouldn't wait for like seconds or like 5 seconds for that service to uh, respond back to you uh, retries right Assume it's gonna fail. Like, like this is what I was mentioning. Like, assume it's gonna like the the system can fail while producing. Uh, it can fail while consuming. It can fail while writing to a database. It can happen at any point uh, in your whole system, right? Uh, so, in order to deal with the uh, like a failures, you need to have a retries. And then the moment you have retries, you need to have item potency in place, right? Uh, of course, like testing. Um, but I think like backward compatibility is an interesting topic, right? Like let's say in an earlier case, you were able to revert back data, like because you have a single database or like, like you have a schema, but in this case, how do you revert, right? There is no reverts in a simple sense, but you need to send events to trigger the reverse. But of course like, there is a lot of gotchas here, right? Like all of them are listening to your uh, uh, pub sub. Like now this pub sub becomes a core central piece of your architecture. You can't afford to have like uh, performance degradation here, or let's say if somebody pushes a message which is out of contract, then you'll be stuck. So in order to deal with that, like you need to ignore messages which is uh, not falling into a particular contract. Uh, you should have a dead letter queue stuff like hey, if you process, if you try to process ten messages uh, for like twenty times, and if it doesn't work, I will deal with this message later on and then move on to other messages, right? Because Consider this as a stream of events, like every second uh, you have some requests and message coming in. You don't want to wait like on a single message and because of which you will be stuck on all other messages, right? There is a lag. So there is a concept called lag here, like probably I can show it later. Uh, those are some stuff, right? Like of course, like there's something called Hystrix, uh, which tells about like circuit breakers and microservices, but in this scenario, like the biggest thing I would say is you cannot go without having uh, observability in place because the moment you have so many pieces go coming in, how do you know where it failed or like where the latency is increased, where the message is lost? Like you need to have tracing in place. Uh, then like let's say load testing, right? Uh, that's something super critical, right? Like I'll, I'll probably go here. Um, so Imagine you have a service and then like in order to know what is the bottleneck, like this, this is what we will be doing, right? Hey, my expectation for this service, like so-called like customer service is 50K requests per second. But in order to be safe for six months, I will be doing a load testing of like 500K requests per second and then monitor everything and then see where the bottleneck is and then like fix the issues, something like that, right? So, so this is needed. Uh, and stuff like you need to leverage so many different kind of components as well, right? So we talked about scaling your architecture with event-driven system, but as I was showing earlier in, in, in like architecture with regions, you need to adopt so many other conceptual like uh, things to in, improve your performance or scale your systems as well, right? So replication is rather than you having a single database, like that will become a failure. You replicate and then have a different database. You can shard, right? So in this case, sharding is could be as any customer who has a lat long which falls into Canada region, it goes into this Canada uh, servicing architecture. Any service which has a lat long and user region goes into these. And then within these two, how do you shard, right? It could be a simple mod, or it could be like a 
user ID mod two, or it could be some other factors through which you decide which particular shot to go in. Uh, it's applicable in database. It's also applicable in request write uh, routing with load balancers as well. Of course, load balancer, right? Like as I said, you will have multiple instances and then you will have a load balancers. Even for load balancers, you will have a load balancers. If that load balancer fails, like it's, it could be because of a single DNS, then you will have multiple DNSs also, uh, stuff like that. So the scaling, like you can, I, I sort of say it in a funny way, right? Like you're not really solving the problem, but you are just moving the bottleneck from one point to other point. And eventually that particular bottleneck will show up over time. Uh, of course, you need to have metrics in place, right? Like unless you know what is being uh, read, what is being written uh, at a particular point, you can't really do any debugging. Um, these are really uh, good tools. Like, like, of course, a lot of people leverage Kubernetes because these concepts we talked about, like replicas and scaling, it, it comes in built, right? So that's why people use Kubernetes. But if you're not in a scale like where you need Kubernetes, I think you're better off without it because of course, like managing Kubernetes can be a pain point as well. HR proxy is a load balancer. Nginx is a load balancer. Google pops up. Chaos testing is an interesting concept. Like I've added a reference from Netflix. Imagine you have 500 microservices and then all the 500 microservices is running in five instances. Each of them is running in like five instances. So you will have so many machines, right? The chaos testing is basically, I can randomly plug out a database from the network. I, I will randomly delete VM. I'll randomly stop a service. Then how does your whole business evolve? Of course, like in order to tackle that, like you need to like track that, you need to have testing in place, like continuous testing. Then like I am introducing failure points at different places. Uh, and then like you see how the system behaves for it. And then like in order, you need to have like all the rollbacks and then uh, failure handling mechanisms in order to deal with it rather than like whole system catastrophic failure. Uh, of course, observability and stuff like that, right? So having said that, I think uh, the major detail is in, in, in terms of event-driven architecture is uh, again, coming back to this basics, right? You can mess up your architecture if you don't, if you haven't defined the right boundaries. And then if you don't send uh, small kind of events, like rather than calling orders, what if you create an event and then say every payment, every order, every details change in your system, if you push it in the same queue, then you can't scale it, right? So of course you need to have good boundaries defined, good microservices established, good domain in terms of team, not, not only team, like uh, what services makes uh, a boundary, like, hey, for this service, we'll send this particular event. Even though I have multiple services, order makes sense, payments events make sense. Does it make sense to like have a, let's say, location event? Like unless you really need it, uh, you, like don't like, like exaggerate and then like put everything in place because it's hard to downscale, right? That, that's the issue. So, uh, yeah, I, again, I think like, like I'll, I'll go, I can go into uh, details of uh, Kafka producer and consumer, but probably I'll stop here. I'll take questions and I'll probably come back to uh, the details if there is anything. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at a bunch of questions. Um, so essentially creating more than which UI. I, I, I can share the tool, like it's I just called Kafka UI. Um, yeah, let me read out the questions because um, yeah, for the webinar replay, especially people would be able to see them. But uh, do you wanna like, did you finish, right? We can start with the Q and A. Yeah. Okay. Cool, so the first question, uh, you already answered that. Um, creating more than one funnel so that it can take on easier flow and mitigate any overload. I guess this referring to something you were showing. Uh, so I'm gonna assume the funnel is this uh, in terms of queuing. Um, and I, I still need more context. I think this is a bit high level question. Uh, the overload is, and I mean, yes. So to an extent, let's say you can have a topic, uh, and within the topic, like imagine, like it's a funnel of like multiple topics, and within that topic, you have you can have ten partitions or you can have like fifty partitions, right? So the partitions is a 
very critical thing for like having n number of consumers you can't run 100 parallel instances if you have one partition right because you only have one stream of data like it doesn't automatically do it kafka handles everything with partitions so in this case like i'll just quickly go here i have one topic which has three partitions but i have one topic which has 10 partitions right so not only you have multiple topics but within each topic you can imagine it's an index of arrays of data and stuff like that sequence data uh within each like like it's a queue and then multiple queue within a queue like like to topic right so you can assume in that way so in order to scale it you would have to scale the number of partitions here so let's say uh like there are means to increase partitions so uh like i can basically say we have a data of console data right so i'm just going to go to uh console data you see the partitions is two i can actually say the partitions is 20 and then in, in some time like it's going to increase the number of partitions to 20 here uh that that's it's all with funneling right so that that's pretty much it uh so yeah so you can see right like the console data is 20 so now you can't like you can go beyond running two consumers but you can run 20 consumers so that's the context but again like it's very specific details like happy to sort of share in detail uh later on so yeah yeah if you want to reach out on platform engineering slack channel uh dinner dish is there <laughs> uh another question is which ui are you using for kafka so I'm actually running um, Provector's Labs Kafka UI, uh, but there are multiple uh, Kafka UIs which is available. Like long back, there is something called um, there was something called Kafka Manager by LinkedIn. Uh, it's still it's it's, it's a very old uh, date like UI, but it it gives data. I personally love Burrow. Uh, there is a tool called Burrow, uh, and then I'll, I'll I'll find it and then share it. I'll I'll share the list of tools. Right, that tool gives you the same kind of um, UI or data in terms of like how many consumers you have. Each consumer, for for instance, like where does it stand? Like, do you have you consumed all the data? Like, is there a lag and all of that? Right. So there there are multiple tools, but yeah, I I use one. Like, I just picked one for like uh, demo purposes. Nothing else. Yeah. Um, Cool. We'll share the list of tools um, tomorrow with the follow-up. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, what does the empty state mean in the UI? I don't know what the, uh, like, like, which one is a, like, if you, if you have any specific thing you can shoot, but I don't know what you mean by empty state here. Uh, chat for more clarification or like, I'll happy to answer like offline. Yeah, maybe yeah. screenshot uh, what you meant. And you'll also share the, the webinar recording uh, tomorrow, or you can find it on the YouTube. Uh, let me just drop in the link over here real quick. Yeah. So I can take the next question. Like, how is Kafka different from Redis, right? Uh, yeah. So Redis is basically very, very different. Like, it's, it's a caching storage. So in this case, uh, assume like a database is actually external uh, VM or like external machine which has the data store. Uh, for instance, every request you are checking user ID for a particular user, right? Like for be it login, be it payment processing, be it anything, like you need a particular uh, metadata associated with a particular user. You don't have to go to a database, but rather you cache some data. Like once I log in, I can say, hey, you know what? For this user with this email, this is the user metadata. And then like I can go and read that uh, Redis, which is actually gonna take like microseconds or like a nanoseconds, then like going into database, which takes milliseconds. It's purely for caching. It's key uh, value storages. So I think um, I just realized my um, like, like text is too slow, but anyways, so as you can see, like I have a bunch of keys and then like there is a key and then there's just a value, there's nothing else. But in terms of event-driven system, it's a storage mechanism, but you send in data and producers, like you can have multiple producers sending into the same queue and then you can have multiple consumers consuming from same queue. Not only that, I can say, hey, I have, uh, bike orders i have like car orders i have different different orders i can say hey consume all orders like star orders so there is a lot of 
benefits with it. And then like, it, it also has multiple details, right? Like, let's say uh, when you consume it, and then if something is not received, the Kafka actually knows where you are at. So if there is a stream of messages and then if you stopped at 50 second message, when you restart the consumer, it's gonna send you the 50 second message again. So, but in terms of it, it's just a lookup mechanism, nothing else, uh, but yeah. Uh, cool. Cool. Is there a limit to partition number based on broker number for a topic? So that's a good question, right? So there is no limits. Um, I think like you can go beyond 200, 500 and all of that. I don't, I don't know whether there is a limit. Maybe there is, like I haven't looked at it. But the point is you don't need that much partitions. Like ideally, like we took, like my, my team, we were managing the Kafka cluster for really large scale. But we took a stance saying that at any time you're going beyond 20, 30, probably you have some issue in your consumer. You can't process the message quickly enough. Uh, that is why you are you need to you need need to scale. So prove me that your processing time is fine, then we'll increase it, right? So most of the times, like in my organization, except for one location live things, we had 50 partitions, but everything else, like we were able to do with 12, 24. Like mostly 24, 36, like 36 is even higher uh, is what I would say. The reason is there is a downside to partitions, right? Like if you have so many partitions, like what this means is like, I think like I, I miss the, like, like I don't have the Kafka architecture in, uh, in this uh, example, but the Kafka is basically, you have five brokers imagine, uh, and all of the brokers need to sync data from each other. And then as you increase the network latency increases, and then like the Kafka performances can also degrade. So you need to be really cautious. And also the biggest point is if you increase the number of partitions to hundred, you can't reduce it to 50. So always go slowly. Only when you hit a bottleneck, when you know that it's not the processing time of consumer, it's the Kafka, like scale it, if not stick to less numbers. Yeah. Cool. Uh, could you share a GitHub repo for some uh, sample application that has uh, this event-based architect um, based architecture implemented? So, is it something you can share uh, with? The uh, sure. I have my uh, like GitHub, uh, like pretty much everything. I'll push it to uh, my Devdenu GitHub, uh, or I'll share it later on uh, with you as well. Uh, but more more than that, I would suggest like like like. Uh, I'll, I usually suggest Byzantine generals problem. This is actually a very interesting concept. Like there is multiple generals who is attacking a particular fort. Imagine there is no like communication me medium between them. Like how do they synchronize, right? There are some interesting learnings, which, which is exactly mapped to like distributed systems. Um, I, I, I can share those things, which just gives you exposure to why distributed systems is super complex. Uh, cap theorem, if you haven't heard about it, like you should definitely read. Like if you need consistency, you can't have like partitions. If you have more partitions, like, like this is a partitions in a different context, you have more availability, but the moment you have more availability, you are actually trading off consistency. Uh, like if you're using DynamoDB, Cassandra, all this columnar storage, basically they are trading availability for consistency. So Kafka is similar, right? So there, there are a lot of interesting details around it. Uh, but again, like I'll I'll share it. You can look at my bunch of talks and stuff like that probably later on. Yeah. Cool. Uh, how do you track coordination or completeness for a single customer order across different consumer groups? Um, I, I don't know. But could you repeat the question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do you track coordination or completeness for a single customer order across different consumer groups? Uh, so I think like, like, uh, again, like I would say, ignore the different consumer groups, right? Like treat it. Like if you have a payment service, you have a single consumer group within that consumer group, how many instances you are running, like just abstract it. Hey, it's a consumer. You can have four instances processing a particular message or like 10 instances processing a particular message, but you don't need within the same service, like let's say you are tracking each order and then payment is completed or not, like you're just tracking one by one, you don't need two instances, right? So in that way, like a single consumer group will consume all the messages. But if you need a different service, let's say, hey, rather than payment service, you are track, like let's say uh, aggregation service, like end of the day, number of orders tracking, right? It's a different consumer group. So like, like when I 
uh, created a uh, console consumer, um, as you can see, like I name it, right? So if I create 10 like terminals with the same name, it is called single consumer group. But if you name it as a different one, it's a different consumer group. So the 10 messages in a topic is going to come to consumer new as well as consumer new one. So I hope that answers it. But like you can go read up on this terms, right? It's like, how does partition as well as consumer plays a role together in Kafka? Yeah. Cool. Um, next question. Um, so Kafka is not good at handling rollbacks. Do you have any advice or experience um, with that specific use case? I don't know what you mean by like, like Kafka is not good at handling rollbacks because it's just going to process events. And uh, like there's two things, right? If you're using Kafka as a database, it's wrong. Like it's probably wrong. You should be sending data and then like all of the consumers should be consuming within a day. Maybe you can have like seven days and stuff like that. But when you say rollback, you're actually interested in like making some changes in uh, like the downstream of data, right? Like, like A, let's say I created an order and then they paid, but for some reasons I want to change the order state or uh, some reasons I want to re, uh, like delete the credit for a driver, right? So in that case, you would be sending an another event into the system, say, hey, uh, recredit or like revert uh, this particular order payment. Then the consumers have to process and handle it. So the rollback is in that case, right? Uh, there is a different context to it. Like, let's say, hey, if you fail, and then if your consumer has failed, uh, you can go back and then read last two days of messages and then process everything. Like, it's sort of rollback in this scenario, but I don't really agree with, like, hey, Kafka is bad for rollback. But again, like, feel free to shoot, shoot more context. Uh, in terms of domain, your servers have to handle it. In terms of data, you need to resend it and then consume. If the consumer failed in the middle, like Kafka is good at like keeping the data uh, reliably across multiple brokers. So you, like even if you're not like up for let's say two hours, you can start from the same place. So uh, I think it's, it should be good. It's it's really good. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what's your op stack? Are there any lessons learned? Uh, I'm going to assume like you, you're mentioning like observability stack. Uh, we've used all the market leaders like way back in time, like Datadog, Sentry, um, like a, every tool, but like it it became expensive for us to an extent. Uh, but we started adopting open source tools. So we ended up using Grafana, uh, Influx Stack, uh, and then we like, of course, tracing, setting up tracing is hard. So we were using Eager for that. Uh, I think the biggest learning, it, it could be a separate topic, like, like even I'm building something around that, right? Like in my startup. So the biggest learning I would say is like most of time, like, like there, there's two sides, right? Like it's not just logs pushing logs. Uh, there are so many aspects in terms of observability. Hey, APIs, every API, you need to track few things. There is something called red metrics. You can go and read like SRE, like Google SRE has, a, has it. You can track latency, error rates, uh, and then like a rate. That is a good thing. Pretty much for all API, you need to track it. But more than that, you also need to be sending custom domain metrics. So it's actually nicer to have a alert saying, you know what, usually you are, like you handle hundred orders in a minute, but in this last five minutes, you don't have any orders at all. So that's a better representation than let's say, hey, I have 500s. Of course, like 500s is a good representation for us. Like, that should be there, but there can be a lot of noise as well. So just like technical metrics, business metrics is equally important. Uh, you need to monitor not only your services, you need to monitor infrastructure. Uh, you need to monitor uh, like, like this tracing is not just uh, like with respect to time, right? It's like, hey, if I send a message, if I have 10 components in downstream, who's taking what, like how much time and then like where it's failed and all of that. So centralized logging is a very different discussion. So there is so many aspects like metrics, dashboard, visualization, uh, and then alerting. Like, like that, that is the three pillars sort of thing. But, but again, it's a very different discussion. Uh, it's good to have more metrics like for visibility purposes, but alert as you go and do it. Don't do it reactively, I would say that. Like I would say have a production checklist, whatever is critical, like start monitoring those upfront. Like I would say that is a 
is the biggest thing. Like I've seen most of the people think that they can live in life, like go live without observability, but most of the time it's, you're wrong. It's good to have observability. If you go down, then it's there to, for debugging purposes. If you go live without that, uh, you don't have any visibility at all. So yeah, like start from it from day zero. So yeah. That it seems that we need another session on Kafka, Danish. So many questions and so much um, discussion. Uh, next question: Can you send me, uh, metadata like JSON through Kafka or only a message string? So, I mean, I haven't dived into detail, uh, right? Uh, but this is a Go code. You can ignore it. Uh, you can write any kind of contract. Uh, into the Kafka. You can write JSON and then the consumer can read JSON. In our case, we used to use protobuf because it, it takes much more or less uh, space, like binary imported. Uh, and then we used to have protobuf contracts in the consumers and then we used to decode it. You can send messages, anything. There is no contract validation per se, like when you're pushing messages, but that's the only catch. That's why I was saying, if you push any random thing into it, your consumer should be handling it appropriately. But if you are a question, you can send JSON any schemas. There are some schema libraries around it. Uh, yeah, you can push anything, but you, you can't revert back, right? Like, like all of the consumers should be adhering to the contract. You can't have two different contracts on the same topic. Like those are all some, of course, gotchas. But yeah, like you can push a schema in, in Kafka messages. And I see some people, um, also VJ says you can uh, even write protobuf, uh, you can just need uh, serialize and deserialize it. Something. Yeah, yeah. You, you can write any schema, like protobuf, uh, like any other different uh, like schemas which is working for you. You can have a custom schema, like as long as you can encode and decode it. Uh, Kafka is just like a store, right? So you can send anything, so yeah. Cool. Uh, and I think that this will be the last question uh, and we'll take other Q&A in the platform engineering Slack channel, if that's okay with you guys, since if you're on time and uh, I realize that most of you probably need to go back um, to work. So uh, I will just like post the platform engineering Slack channel once again, and I'll copy all of the questions uh, in there uh, and tag Danish. So Danish, if you can please uh, answer them today or tomorrow, that would be really great. And last question, what's the common solution pattern to connect REST endpoint to message system like Kafka? I mean, the endpoint receiving the request may not be the same as owner of the right partition. Uh, okay, so the rest is just a, uh, like what do you call that? Uh, like it's an API, right? If you have an API, uh, which like all the like different microservices is calling you as an API, internally, you don't have to dump the same JSON. Ideally, you, you would create a new contract and then push that message to Kafka. With respect to ownership, yes, that's a good point, right? Treat some services as the source of truth. For instance, Unless you're pushing an aggregate, nobody should be sending an order creation events, like except the order transaction service, right? Why would a random, like let's say payment service push something to orders? So in that sense, like just similar to how in microservices, how you define, uh, this is my database. A, with respect to customers, I go to customer service. Any details with respect to drivers, like I go to driver service. In the same way, the events should be generated from the source of truth, like in this case, the appropriate microservices. Of course, it's possible that like, like you can have format, like if you have two different order generation or processing services, they can send it to appropriate orders, but you can have a different key combinations. Like you can call it uh, like a bike orders and car orders example, for, for an example, right? But I don't think like a rest is directly mapped to here. Like you can, if you want, but ideally like you do some bunch of operations the moment it's done, then you send an event. Order is created, or order is updated, order is deleted, order is like picked up, order payment complete, and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, like like it's not one to one mapping, is what I would say. So yeah, cool. Well, we're on time, unfortunately, but uh, I promise you guys, I copied all of the questions uh, into Platform Engineering Slack channel, and uh, I will uh, ask Danish very kindly to go in and uh, answer them all today. 
um, or tomorrow. So uh, you'll see it there, the platform engineering link, um, I posted it in the chat. Uh, it really seems that Kafka topic resonates a lot, so Danish, we should probably schedule another session with you. But thank you so much for this one. It was very insightful, lots of questions, lots of conversations. And um, thank you. Hope you have a great rest of the day, everyone. And see you next week. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Maria, for organizing. Of course, like my passion, like I'm super passionate about Kafka. We've dealt with it like so high scale. Like I've seen so many downtimes, like so much war stories. So I'm happy to share it. Uh, apart from that, like it's just a plug, right? Like I am building on that DevOps space because I have seen that personal po pain point over time, but I'm happy to share any learnings or if you think it's relevant, uh, like we should talk. Uh, feel free to DM me on Twitter or like in platform engineering Slack channels or like I've also shared much more topics uh, and talks around the same, uh, like building backend systems, Kafka, Golang, and all of that. Uh, you can also see that in uh, uh, like my uh, blog and YouTube channels. So yeah, like really happy to uh, be here. Thanks again for hosting. Thanks for your time. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll do another probably uh, advanced talk. Looking forward to see more folks again. Yeah, let's set it up, definitely. Cool. Thank you so much, guys.